In this video, I talk with my friend, Aaron Stryker. Aaron's the founder of Dharma Gates, a nonprofit that's helping bring deep contemplative practice to young people. It's a vision and an organization that's inspired me for a couple of years. I wrote about them last year with Aaron on my blog post, but I wanted to have Aaron on the show and talk to him a bit more about what they're up to and how people can get involved and raise awareness about the good work that they're doing. So uh, I really enjoyed talking to Aaron, hearing about the vision that they have for the future and how Dharma Gates fits into that. And I hope you'll enjoy hearing about the work that they're doing. And if you do find the vision that they share inspiring, please consider making a donation to Dharma Gates. Nonprofits really need help. And there's a theirs is a vision that I personally really believe in and think is beneficial to the world. So um, if you do feel inspired as I do, then consider making a donation of any size to Dharma Gates. Hi, Aaron. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, Tashin. Great to be here. Uh, as you know, I've been a big fan of your work and Dharma Gates for a good while now and really wanted to have you on the channel to talk about what you're up to and what Dharma Gates is up to and just share a little bit and raise awareness for the good work that you're doing. So really appreciate the chance to talk. Um, can you start by just telling me a little bit about yourself and your own history with practice? Uh, yeah, so, well, I started practicing when I was 18. I'm 24 now. Um, I'll be 25 in a couple months. Uh, I started practicing in the Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga tradition uh, a little bit into my freshman year of college. And I basically because um, I started having kinds of spiritual experiences that weren't, uh, that required some kind of other framework and way of working with my system to stay coherent and functional and like able to, you know, not uh, go crazy. Um, <laughs> it's the shortest way to put it. And um, there was a sort of, you know, I, I knew I had some sense, I knew what was happening. I knew that these were spiritual experiences I also knew that the people who could help me with them were probably spiritual people. Uh, and I made contact with a yoga teacher from my hometown uh, named Angela, who is a student of Shinzen Yang and also a longtime practitioner of Ashtanga Yoga. And she helped me get sorted, <laughs> kind of get like, get a practice and, and realize the importance of practice that it, I really, um, had to do it. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't very, didn't feel like uh, there was a lot of optionality for me uh, in my, my getting started. Um, and yeah, I started, I, I practiced mostly just Ashtanga for a couple of years. I went to, took a year off from college and I worked in landscaping and did a lot of yoga. And then I went to India for a few months and that was great. India is, I love it there. Um, at least where I was. And uh, after that trip, I sort of was like, this is what I want to do with my life. Um, this is going to be the main thing I do. And yeah, I, I then I met some kids who practice Zen in, in college. Uh, I, I met, I had a friend named Liam who did a Kese, a three month training period at a monastery in upstate New York. And um, I went up and visited with him and that also completely messed up and changed my life. <laughs> um, it, it, I think <clears throat> uh, something about going to that environment, I realized that there were people in the US who were doing these kinds of, this kind of self cultivation very seriously. Um, and it suddenly became a question for me, like, you know, you can also go live at Daibasatsu Zendo for free for several years. And so it became a question for me, like, do I wanna be in college? Do I wanna make money? Do I care about um, any of this stuff enough to, to be here? And it wasn't, it wasn't clear at all. Um, I spent the rest of my time in college basically battling whether I should be there and whether it was worth it to get a degree. Um, 
but that was that was me and my own personal calling and relationship to mass monasticism where it just felt incredibly natural and you know i don't i don't hold the position that that's like what everybody should do um but but for my own personal calculus i uh it it was very very strong from basically the beginning uh, and I, I spent the rest of college going and visiting different monasteries and doing short periods mostly in zen um doing retreats and then uh, cooked up this whole idea for Dharma Gates when I was a senior and uh, started working on that uh, too. Can you tell me a little bit more about um, the Ashtanga yoga practices and uh, what that flavor, practicing that flavor of yoga has been like for you? Oh, I love it so much. It's like, in some ways, I, I really consider it my like home, mm -hmm. uh, my, my base practice. And um, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful practice. It's basically uh, has this deep devotional element. Um, and there's a concentration technique that you do as you're doing asana. So it's a pretty strong concentration based practice. And then you do asana and you, you learn more and more of these postures and work with a teacher and like when you're doing it traditionally you'll go in the morning before you eat any food and you work one-on-one -on -one with the teacher or there'll be a group of people there but everybody has their own practice and there's nobody at the front leading like leading you through a series you you just have your set of postures and you do it and everybody does it silently and with their concentration and then the teacher walks around and will correct you and the room's like hot but only with the heat of of bodies it's not hot with artificial heat usually or if you practice in a tropical area it's it's um, hot because it's hot outside but um the flavors like this like there's this fiery incinerator that you go in in the morning and it just like burns up your karma and you leave feeling amazing and concentrated and like really blissed out and you just do it over time and it starts to change the way you're you sense and participate in the world you stop I, I find it's extremely powerful for like you stop craving certain things and you start being more in touch with what feels good to eat and how to treat people and you just become a lot more sensitive and uh if that arc if you follow it long enough and you start adding you know an awareness of the energy body and like ethics and concentration and it does lead towards a very deep practice but some people don't use it that way. Some people use it just because it feels really good and, and they accidentally do a lot of purification in the process. Um, but if you become intentional about it and you really dive into the tradition, um, there are people who, who take it very far, especially once you start combining it with dhyana or the, the higher limbs and concentration. Um, so yeah, it's beautiful um, and uh, I found a lot of the Ashtangis I know are really um, well there's this smoothness that can come about in your relationship to samsara like in your relationship to the mundane that that yoga can be really beautiful for like bringing it into the here I am <laughs> in this in this body in this life and like and it feels good enough that it's tolerable <laughs> even from the perspective of like a, a very deep practice you're not fighting reality quite as much how, how would you say that doing the yoga practice is related to and impacted your seated meditation and buddhist practices that's like it's like how has meditation impacted my meditation <laughs> No, no, it's just, yeah. It's like a, there's like a non, like yoga is, is a kind of meditation that's mm -hmm. very powerful. And um, it's more like, like there's a lot of purification that I've done through yoga. And then there's a lot, like some purification I've done through meditation, some like processing and clarifying and, um, 
yeah, you keep doing it. And uh, I, I, I find that the, the asana practice is good for some things that it seems to be hard to hit with meditation and vice versa. Like uh, there's certain, I remember like doing a couple Zen retreats and like starting to have these real experiences of equanimity, like, like not being as impacted by things at this really deep level and was like, oh, that's good. Like there's good stuff. And, and that hadn't really come about through asana. Um, but on the other hand, like asana can put you in touch with the energy body and in touch with subtle, like intuitive experiences and, uh, help you like regulate your daily like habits in this amazing way that a lot of Buddhists I know really struggle with like mm -hmm. waking up early and like eating good food and like exercising enough and, <laughs> and stuff like that like there's this kind of element of right relationship with the body that um that a lot of Buddhists I know have like a very deep um sitting practice and then like when they bring it you try to bring it into like every other part of your life and you're like eating junk food and like not not exercising and it's like now there's this kind of I find the asana can be really really good for um for that for finding like what's right relationship with this living organism that we're in um and not not in a way that like like it can you know and it's in its sort of shadow it can go towards uh people think that that's the whole path and you're like you feel good in your body and you feel good after yoga and you 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 think that that's awakening and it's definitely not but uh on the other hand it can can allow for this kind of harmony that um that i think is really important and a lot of people I th i've definitely gone to like gone into monastic environments or gone into like thinking that that's what it was going to help me with and it seems like maybe it does in the very long term, but sometimes also you can go on a retreat and you still like have bad habits. And so, so gradually like bringing those in line too is, is like long work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It makes complete sense that you'd experience them as just like mutually supportive and in some ways not even distinct. And then from that, from another angle, I think, um, you know, for myself, I, I didn't really start doing body practices until quite late in my career as a, as a meditator. And I think that, you know, you starting there with the body practices gave you certain advantages from what I can tell of like, um, you know, yeah, like what you said of right relationship to the body where there's a lot of like traps that you might have been able to avoid or uh, problems or things like that. So I don't think I did fully. <laughs> uh, sure, like, sure. I don't think I'm like, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a gradual. Um, some of this stuff I'm like, I, I'm talking in a way is like, I see the, like the line, like I see how this stuff can work. And also like it's stuff I'm still working with and struggle with. And sure. Sure. Definitely. Um, I well, think I, I'm can, just, what's that? I think you can assist in, in, uh, why well, I, I often think of the metaphor of like, like when you're practicing like med seated meditation, one a technique is, is like a mirror in a way, and you're kind of studying and you're learning more about yourself. But if you have a mirror at a different angle, you'll get a whole different side, a whole different perspective on, on yourself and body practices can do that. Like you, and, and actually a lot of mirrors, cause like in asana, like in Ashtanga, you have all these postures and every posture is a different mirror. Like every posture is a different angle. So there's a way that you resist your life in, in every different posture. And like, we're doing this John Jong stuff, you know, the standing meditation and you have this standing posture and, and there's all this resistance that can come up in that posture that, that might not even be accessible in, in seated meditation. And so you can think of Ashtanga as just like, you do that with tons of postures and you're like trying to let go of your resistance to all of them. And, and so there's a lot of different angles that you're getting feedback. Um, right. Yeah. But part, part of the reason I ask about this is just, I'm really, uh, I guess you'd say bullish on doing body practices in, in tandem with seated mm -hmm. formal practice. And I think uh, yeah. you have an interesting 
point of like having done both of them for a long time. So I'm appreciative of that. So um, yeah, so tell me about Dharma Gates and, and um, how, how did Dharma Gates get started? I mean, not every college student basically starts an, a nonprofit. So how did that happen? Well, I, I went to a summer program at this monastery in Oregon called Great Vow. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is amazing. Like they, they, Great Vow is one of these monasteries that's done a really good job at making themselves accessible to younger people. And they do that through offering this really cheap six week or they, the weeks vary summer by summer, but they have this program where you go and you, it's intense. You're fully immersed in their schedule and you do like a couple, one or two session, like week long retreats and you're sitting three hours a day or what have you. And um, even outside of session and it was amazing. It was, it was like a great experience. And I was like, why, um, why doesn't everybody know? Like, why don't young people realize that there's the, there are these opportunities where if you're the right kind of person in the right kind of situation, like you want to go spend three months, uh, and have your whole life changed. There are all these places you can go that are just waiting. Um, and so that became just a, a question for me. And I, I, had a friend named Miles who um, trained at the Monastic Academy, but also did a lot of training in other traditions uh, after college. He's about five or six years older than I am. And I called him up and was like, why doesn't this exist? <laughs> he was like, I don't know, it should exist. And after that, we just started talking every week about like, okay, what would the next step be to make this happen? And, you know, I signed up for this little entrepreneurship course in my college and was like what's the next this seems like the next step if I was really going to do this and so I like started talking to people about it and then uh, I had a, a mentor there who like really pushed me was like this is a good idea Aaron like not that many people actually come to this course with good ideas and um, at the end of the semester she told me to go pitch the idea in front of a bunch like at the Connecticut Entrepreneurship Foundations like pitch competition and it was in front of all these like stodgy businessmen um <laughs> it, it was just not a dharma crowd at all uh -huh. and uh and i did it and some of them liked it and i was like uh -huh. oh, like Whoa. something's happening here like they think this is a viable business model and i got like 750 dollars from the competition i got some some like bottom rank award or something but <laughs> But I was like, oh, this is like, I'm, I'm just was continually surprised by the, the reception I got. And so um, there was also this funny thing where I like finagled my way into a gap year fair and like made some materials and set it up like we had a gap year program, even though we really didn't. <laughs> and <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, we were just trying to like, trying to yeah. see what, 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 we, what we could do and like talk to people. And if, you know, if some student had been like, I really want to do this I would have just worked with them and been like look here are the options like there are monasteries out there like there are kind of our gap year programs um so so yeah um uh, just started doing stuff and um by the time I graduated we we ended up getting a couple grants um and I graduated with 11,000 some you know ten thousand dollars or something to put towards this and uh, moved into the Ann Arbor Zen Buddhist Temple and lived there and worked on Dharma Gates and did yoga with my home teacher. Ann Arbor is my hometown. So I was kind of recovering and practicing and like slowly trying to build this thing. And then I moved to Maple. Um, so I was at Maple for nine months and uh, then I left Maple in December and now I'm here, <laughs> basically. And Dharma Gates has just kept on kept rolling slowly. So what, what is Dharma Gates currently offering? What are the current programs that you're doing? Yeah, um, right now with COVID, uh, we're doing all this online stuff. We're trying to work with different communities and teachers and basically offer a wide sampling of possible communities, ways to look at practice, ways to, ways to get involved with sort of deeper views of, of um, 
meditation. Uh, we're slowly kind of opening up some of our events to older audiences. Mostly we've been concentrated on young people, but um, seems a little bit uh, unclear how we're gonna concentrate our energies going forward. We might have more events for older folks. Um, and then we're excited to have uh, in-person event stuff going. Like, honestly, I'm we're more interested in in-person. Uh, I think online can be a great gateway experience, but um, at the end of the day, if you wanna really get a, a flavor for what, what these practices are like, then in-person is the way to go. And um, we have a summer program coming up that's going to be really interesting, a kind of two week uh, immersion program for young people in Vermont, northern Vermont, in this big old farmhouse we rented where um, it's going to be kind of a, you might think of it as a meditation and leadership training program, sort of similar to what Maple does, but a little crash course and more gentle, you know, um, and We'll have a few days of silent retreat practice and a few days of circling and uh, skill building, compassion practice, meta stuff hmm. each week. And so, yeah, we're excited to get that going again. I, I mean, I love the in-person stuff and long term, I, I mean, what I what I'm imagining, what I want to see is sort of a lot of uh, more relationships between all kinds of like deep contemplatives in the US and um, colleges and universities where, where student groups are kind of able to bring a steady stream of different sort of people into onto their campuses to be like, look, like, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing, and you're welcome, like, this is a thing you can do. And, you know, like, it is, sounds like a funny comparison, but Christians have been doing this forever like Christians are really good at this. And, mm -hmm. and um, I think Buddhists are often like not pushy to the extent that people don't even know what's out there. <laughs> they don't even know they're there. You don't even know that there's real, like real monasteries in the U S where you can go spend time. And some people that's like exactly what they need. Uh, and so to me, it was like, I want to make sure like people know in, in, in Asia, you know, if you grow up in a, a culture that's Buddhist, um, everybody knows, everybody knows how this stuff works. And, and if you want to, if it, if it feels right to you, you can run away to a monastery at a young age and go do that. And I want that to be possible, <laughs> actually. Like I, I want people who, um, who have that calling to like know and have the resources and be able to fully follow it. Because for me, it was like, for me, it was essential. Like if I hadn't had those tools, like if I hadn't had the right people in the right time and the right like frameworks, I would probably be in a psych ward or something. Like it would have been bad. It, it's not like for some people you have to do it. Um, and yeah, we want to like help that, help that happen. Yeah. I mean, that's such a big part of why I've like immediately resonated with the work that you're doing because um, you know, I've mentioned this elsewhere, but like I started meditating on my own in college and knew like two or three other people that meditated. They were doing totally different things than what I was doing. It wasn't connected to like real teachers or real teachings. And I had to like figure all that out on my own. And yeah, I also felt really called to monastic practice, but like had to wrestle with whether I should stay in school or drop out or when I should do monastic training and where and like the things that Dharma Gates offers are the things that I could have used a decade ago and um, really want to make sure that people have that opportunity. And so that's why I've been such a big fan. And uh, I'm curious, like, it, it, it makes sense to me, but maybe you could just explain for someone that's watching, like, what, what would, um, you know, this vision that you're talking about where, where, where colleges and universities have access to deep contemplative practice, where there are student groups that are connected to real traditions of Buddhist practice, like what would that afford or enable culturally if that were available? Because mm. it's good, bigger than that, right? Like you don't just want no. student groups to be there or like people to be Buddhist or something. There's something that that makes possible. No, so can you speak true, to that? Which is that, um, oh, 
on a wider on the widest scale possible i think it's like there's this piece that's like really really needed in our culture right now which is basically um a correct understanding of how problems are solved uh like how do we actually like work with the crazy things that are happening in the world and and like the the what popularizing meditation does like deep deep practice not just like working with an app but popularizing deep practice if that really is to happen um i think it will bring a new collective understanding of how we can solve problems like that there's both an external and internal dimension of problem solving and if you're stuck at the external level like most like in college it, I learned a lot about how, you know, we're in this crisis scenario, but like, it seems like there's nothing to be done. Like all of the main external, uh, like things you're pushing against are just so powerful and immovable. And, and it's like, there's nothing we can really do about like the ecological crisis or all of these other things. And, you know, if you have a, if you have an opening, if you're like a, a certain kind of person where you have like enough power or perspective or some kind of opening where you can actually like make a real difference in this thing then like maybe go external but like like try to change things but for a lot of people that they really don't have very much um efficacy in in making change on the external level like because of all the various basically systems in place to to prevent that and so on a wider level, I think it's actually about helping provide experiences so that more and more people have this like, oh, okay, like I, I, I can't really change the world outside, but like I can really change myself, like not a little bit, like I can like change myself in such a way that I like wherever I go in all contexts change other people's perception of the world like dramatically. <laughs> And, and when you meet, meeting like a few people like that, you're like, oh, like just, just this change thing doesn't work how I thought I did. <laughs> it's not, it's not just a matter of like where the physical material building blocks of, of the world are placed. It's also um, what kinds of ideas and views and uh, ways of seeing the world are like, uh, running our lives and are available to us and sometimes like you can meet the the right person and then they they can actually completely open you to a new way of seeing that that um, suddenly there's a lot of options suddenly you're not trapped anymore and and maybe that's what dharma gates can do is like be like we you we really aren't trapped like that's 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 kind of what I that's kind of what I want to say is like um, worst comes to worst, most people, a lot of people can go be a monk. Right now, there's enough beds in the U.S. that like if in, unless you have like responsibilities or dependents or things, which many 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 people do, um, but but there is this opportunity for for everybody for this internal work and. And you can put a lot of energy into that and get a lot of results, um, a lot out of it too. So I think it's, I think it's like, A, it's, it's the physical effect of, of more people going and doing this practice, um, but also the effect uh, that that has on, on culture and on our collective ways of seeing the world. Like, if every college has a couple of young people who've done a, a semester of training at a monastery, then it also affects all of the people that they make contact with. And, and they all like a few months of training and you have a pretty good sense that like there's work to be done on the inside. And then they can go, you know, talk to people and, <laughs> And, and there's a lot of college students, there's a lot of people out there who, who have this interest in awakening or in Dharma or in meditation 
but they they're kind of stuck with it. They don't know what they don't know what the next step is, and they don't they don't feel that they could really do it, or that like it's, and then they just make contact with somebody who's been at a Zen monastery, and suddenly that can just reorient their entire sense of how they're relating to their awakening process. To that, that this is a real thing that people are doing, and like I get to choose whether to do it or not basically like just because just the fact that you know there are zen monasteries in the u.s where that there are genuinely like very awakened people out there actually changes how the mind is constructed because it, it puts us in a world where awakening is real and then you can do what you want with that <laughs> but but like yeah, that that's the thing I wanna I wanna see is like many many more Americans be like have that 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 backdrop to their their world because then if you're not doing it if you're not doing the internal work you're choosing not to you're not you're not like it's not uh, pure ignorance anymore it's like you're making a decision and. Yeah, I'm hearing that um, I, ca I could imagine someone hearing things that you said earlier about like Christianity, for example, is like, oh, this is an evangelical mission where you're like trying to convert people to Buddhism or something. And it sounds like it's less of that of like, oh, you want to convince people of something or, you know, have like a cultural indoctrination or something and more that you see contemplative practice and especially for for young people as being a leverage point towards these bigger societal problems and that that's that's really what's at stake for you. It's less like what people believe or what tradition they're associated with and more that that this is like uh, an entry point into dramatic cultural shifts. Yeah, absolutely. And also that that like, uh, well, I don't I don't care actually that much about Buddhism as a mission. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, Despite it's like how much I talk about online. <laughs> it's a very, effective well-packaged framework for cultivating certain <laughs> qualities of mind and like that's beautiful and like the lineage system has is like beautiful and um and i it, it's very powerful that that has arrived here um and the you know it's actually i think it's kind of impossible to to yeah, we're, we're, you know, it's not about creating a, a set of people who share the same beliefs necessarily. Uh, like that's, that, that wouldn't even solve the problem is like, if everybody was a Buddhist, that wouldn't solve the problem. But, but minimizing the friction for others so that they can follow their own path. Like everybody has this like heart thing this like thing in them that is trying to move in the direction of awakening. Um, I, I believe that. I believe that like there, people are using their best yeses, their best approximations of how the world works and trying to follow it. And um, what you can do is you can help, <laughs> help their like their estimations and the friction between them and the actual thing which is awakening, help minimize that as much as possible. Which is like, you know, if people, if you're, if you're in a student group and you care about meditation or you're, you have a casual interest in practice, like make sure people know about the next step. That's all. It's like, there is a next step and be like being clear about that. Like, you know, there, there is deeper, deeper is there and if you're interested, here are 10 ways you can do that. <laughs> like you're not even limited by like lineage or by tradition or by, you know, you have to follow this thing or believe these things, but like there, there's a whole like set of invitations uh, at every layer of, of where someone is so that they can like use their own internal guidance system to make decision after decision and like maybe that'll be do a couple months of practice somewhere and then like 
leave and spend the rest of your life working at an NGO. And like, that might be actually following your inner guidance system correctly. That might be what your, your like heart wants to do in this, this life. <laughs> so great, you know, um, but, but we want to like set the ideal conditions for people's own uh, sort of inner intuition and inner movement towards awakening to become autonomous, to, to not be restricting it anymore. Hmm. Hmm. You spoke to this a little bit earlier, but, um, you know, there's kind of what Dharma Gates is currently offering and currently up to, and then this, this big ambitious vision for the future. And what do you see as kind of the steps in between from where you are now to where you're going in the future? I mean, frankly, we need funding. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need more, more funding and we also need, uh, I really want this to be a thing that people are invited into, um, including like, you know, all of the, anybody who wants to work with us, like, or anybody who's interested in this kind of vision that, that they have like a place to be involved and to put their energy uh, so that it's not like me or like, any of the people that I'm currently working with as, as like doing this thing um, because I don't think I'll do it very well. And, and there's a lot of wiser people than me out there. And, and I definitely like want, want their guidance and want uh, people with expertise and resources and like to be um, invited into this in a way that feels trustworthy for them and that they have a way to really be of service and put their energy into it. And I don't feel completely clear about how to do that right now. Like, you know, we need funding and we need to, to figure out how to, um, what I'm thinking is create the structure or create the container for something that can actually hold the amount of, of energy and that, that we're imagining putting into it, like from all these different people and sources um, is, is like a, from the Dharma world, like what can we, um, what could we like channel the wisdom of several different, like many different traditions and make it, make it possible to be accessed. And there's a, there's a lot of collaboration that needs to happen there. And so I'm a little bit like daunted <laughs> by that, but also excited by it. I think, I think, um, yeah, we just want to um, be in collaboration. And I think I'm scared of that. <laughs> but, uh... So we'll say someone is inspired and they're, they're really, they want to make, help make this happen. And uh, what, what, what can they do? What, how, how, how can people get involved? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, depends on what kind of person, like what your skills are and what your interests are. Like we, we, if you have relevant skills to running a nonprofit, like we don't really know how to do it. Uh, we're trying to learn. So that, that's one thing that's extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. um, if you have connections, if you're like, you know, have, um, contacts with like lineages that you really respect and trust or teachers that you really respect and trust like we'd love to just enter into dialogue about this and like know get a sense of where you are in the the broader network and and get to know you um and potentially like uh collaborate around the like actual physical work element of of you know what kind of projects are we imagining and what can we get done uh, in terms of just like helping make stuff more accessible to make practice more accessible to the world like we don't feel any I don't feel any sense of being protective of this project um and as much as it's done with integrity and like have people who who seem um trustworthy and balanced involved uh but also 
Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing is, um, if you're a person with resources, uh, we do need funding. And um, we have a, a donate page on our website, or uh, you can also send checks or whatever feels relevant to you, but, uh, or will work for you. But we're a very young organization. We're like two years old. And um, so far, we've basically been functioning with very little money, like, you know, a couple, a uh, few twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year, just kind of scraping things together and getting some funding here and there. And I've been mostly living in monasteries. And, um, and so we might try to hire people <laughs> for the first time, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that seems necessary. And also we will need a different kind of support on the back end to make that work. So, um, yeah. And if you, if you want to just, if you're someone who's uh, listening to this and you want to just talk more um, that's the other way is like I'd love to get more in the weeds with anybody about like what's the uh, what inspires you about this or what ideas do you have or what um, doubts or concerns or questions too do you have about this whole thing mm -hmm. yeah and presumably if someone's like a young person or knows a young person that might be interested in this, they can go to the website as well and check out what programs are currently on offer and participate oh, yeah. in that way as well. Yeah, I, I feel like I completely even lost the thread of what we're already doing, um, mm -hmm. what programs we're offering. But we do, we do in-person online events. We have a newsletter with opportunities to get more involved with practice and with our events and um, then right now we have an advising form where if you're interested in learning more about different opportunities for retreats or residency or basically taking your sitting practice up a, a, a degree of intensity, um, we have an advising form on our website where you can uh, fill it out with a little bit about your background and um, we'll set up a call and talk to you and you know, I'm, I, I, I know I'm also young and I'm a junior practitioner and in between our network, I think we can do a, a good job at fielding basically any kind of inquiry. But uh, if you're an advanced practitioner already and you're wanting to meet with me, like <laughs> I might not be able to help you that much. So, so it really depends on what your, your background is. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're pulling from what expertise we have, but uh, increasingly we're finding that some folks are filling out our advising form and they've already done 10 Goenkas and 20, like, you know, several months of silent retreat in various traditions and are just a, have been practicing for a long time. And um, we can, we can try to field stuff like that, but, but uh, we're, we're mostly aimed at beginning practitioners. So um, yeah. Great. Well, I'm a big fan of what you're doing and thank you for it. And, uh, you know, really excited to be sharing the work that you're doing with the world. So thanks for taking the time to talk to me, Aaron. Yeah, thanks so much, Tashin. It's fun to talk to you in this way.